When you're authentic to who you are, everything else will fall in place. People are gonna love, they're gonna hate, but you never know who's watching. Everything I do, I want it to be as original as can be. Somebody did it like this, I'm gonna do it with this much filler. Who comes back and rescues himself? This was our moment to let people know how we felt as a team. We revolutionized this game with our influence. It's time to tame your mane. No one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye to all your stubble trouble with Manscaped Pro Beard Kit. It all starts with the beard hedger. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths, all with one guard. So no more messy drawers, full of extra add-ons. Plus it's waterproof, so you can shave in the shower, no more hair in the sink. The titanium coated T-blade is tough on hair, but smooth on your face, leading to single stroke efficiency that brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. The Pro Kit doesn't end there though. They have created four dermatology tested formulations for your post trim care, including beard shampoo and conditioner, beard oil, beard balm, and three free gifts, a beard brush, comb, and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress. So get 20% off with free shipping with code SMOKE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code SMOKE. Manscaped Beard Hedgers, one stroke, one guard, 20 lengths. NBA Top Shot is where the NBA's biggest fans buy, sell, and earn officially licensed video collectibles. Rip packs or purchase individual limited edition moments from your marketplace to build your ultimate collection. From rookies to legends, now you can flex your fandom by owning the greatest moments of your favorite players and teams. Your collection can even earn a once in a lifetime money can't buy experience. NBA Top Shot users have already attended private events with superstars like Klay Thompson, rising stars like Cade Cunningham, and even all-time greats like Magic Johnson. Your entire collection of NBA Top Shot moments never loses quality and are accessible by any device. So they're always at your fingertips. Rep your team, flex your fandom, and own the greatest moments from the NBA, exclusively from NBA Top Shot. Sign up today at NBATopShot.com and kickstart your collection with your first pack. And welcome back. Another edition of All the Smoke. Jack, we got a good one today, bro. Legendary. Got a good one today. Legendary. Uh Someone I've been harassing. I'm trying to tell you, been on his ass I'm for like two years. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you Telling him, we need you, we need you. And we keep passing each other. But he finally came out here for something. I found out he was coming out here for something. And uh, he blessed us with his time. Two-time NBA champ, 12-time All-Star, uh, one of the greatest point guards slash players. The original to, Zeke. To ever play this game. The real Zeke. Yes. The one and only. The one and only. Isaiah Thomas. Thank Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate your time, man. Sir, yes, Thank you sir. for coming Thank through. Thank you for being here. Always, always. Uh, there was a rumor just recently that you were going to sign with the Suns on the management side. It came out. And then what's the latest with that situation? So I'm I'm on the board of uh, UWM, which is uh, Matt Ishbia's um, uh, holding company. Okay. And um, you know it it's crazy. You have the the two biggest mortgage companies in the U.S. in Detroit, um, UWM and, and Rocket Mortgage. So I'm on the board. Uh, he and I have been friends for a long time. Um, I advise him on a couple of things. He advised me on a couple of things business wise, and. We've been, you know, really looking for a team since uh, 2021. Um, Matt wanted to get into the business. Um, his brother wants to own a baseball team. Matt wanted to own a basketball team. So, you know, when the story came out, it was only natural that they put us together, you know, advising, still talking, still consulting. Mm -hmm. I don't have any plans of um, being in a front office position okay. ever again in terms of there, running basketball operations. Now, when you talk about uh, advising, consulting, ownership, those type of things, that's probably where I fit in at, um, you know, not necessarily, um, I got too much going on. I don't right. see myself sitting in an office day to day right. running basketball ops again, but from an advising, consulting mm -hmm. standpoint, uh, that is on the table and, okay. you know, we'll see what happens. Interesting. Um, obviously... 
basketball is 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 what you're known for, but now you're known for just your entrepreneurial ism is that a word or entrepreneurial <laughs> ship i mean uh doing very well making shit happen mogul yeah cannabis space champagne space real estate uh private equity um business of basketball wasn't very big when you played because it wasn't very big when we played mm -hmm. you know what i mean now it's it's the norm but you've been able to really capitalize off the court uh with investments and and in in the business space can you walk us through uh first and foremost your champagne cuz you said that's what's keeping you youthful <laughs> So I'm um, um, fortunately enough for me, uh, you know, basketball and sport has given me the opportunity to really, you know, expand globally. Um, and the name of my firm is Isaiah International, and we do a lot of business outside of the United States. So when you talk about the Champagne space, um, we got 200 acres over in the Old region of Champagne, which is the oldest region of Champagne, with the largest Black-owned Champagne company in the U.S. Uh, largest first press uh, grape of champagne in the U.S. And there's three presses of the grape, first press, second press, third press. And as you know, the first press is the best press. Uh, we also are known for our zero and low sugar champagnes. Why did we want zero and low sugar champagnes? Being former athletes, right, uh, most people who drink champagne immediately complain of a headache. Mm -hmm. So you ask the question why, mm -hmm. right? It's the high sugar content and the high sulfites, right? So um, we wanted to bring something back to the U.S., um, not only back to the U.S., but back to, you know, all people who love champagne, drink champagne, promote champagne, but it's not theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we wanted to do is bring you the best of the best. And my econ teacher told me a long time ago that, you know, if you, if you got the highest quality, and you can give it to the customer and the consumer at the lowest price. You're going to win. You win. Then long term, you're going to win the game. Mm -hmm. So it's not the best marketed. It's the, you know, the most, it's the best, highest quality. And we're out here now getting ready to onboard in a couple of the Hyatt hotels. That's where I'm out here. Okay. So Sherlon Champagne, uh, the number one rated zero low sugar, first press of the grape champagne in the United States, black owned and also supported by the 450 NBA players on the NBPA side. Okay. So uh, shout out to the NBPA for, you know, uh, you know, helping and sticking yeah. with the former That's players. And, I mean, we market and everybody else's stuff market. now. We got some black, black yeah. owned, so it's good to get that in there. They might have the all-time most successful backcourt ever. Microwave, super successful. Mm -hmm. Zeke and, and Joe D. Them three, like if you, if you wanted to model yourself as some basketball players that took after advantage basketball. of their career and after mm -hmm. basketball, y'all might have the top basketball, I mean, backcourt in history as far as business-wise. Thank you. Thank now, you. Now, seriously, if you think about it. No, you ain't lying. If you think about it. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's why we on this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's why y'all the number one yeah. show and got all these <laughs> cameras. You think about it that way, though. Like, you think about it that way. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, we, if, if you notice when we was describing ourselves when we were playing, um, the media always gave us the physically tough label. Uh, but we always described ourselves as mentally tough. Mm -hmm. and That's the most important tough. Yeah, it, it's like, you know, you, you, you win with smart people. You know, you win with people who don't make mistakes, uh, you know, who understand how to, you know, operate, work within the system, game plan, you know, make sacrifices, and then you, you try to go out and win the basketball game with it. And fortunately enough for us, we had a, a lot of players that, that wanted to do that and did it at a very high level. Mm -hmm. Real high level. Can you talk a little bit about the cannabis space? That's something that, that Jack and I are both in, and and, and, and it obviously, you know, this push was supposed to be the push for the minority population in that space, and we're, we're still very small percentage yeah. of the uh, population that's making that up. But can you talk to us about what you guys are doing in the cannabis space? So the, uh, I'm chairman and CEO of a publicly traded company called One World Products where we cultivate and grow in Colombia. Now, uh, again, my firm is Isaiah International, and we do a lot of business, most of our business is outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, because outside of the United States, uh, I classify as an American. Inside the United States, I classify as black, and mm -hmm. you get the minority tax. And we got a lot of white folks in here today who travel, you know, and when you travel outside of the United States, your passport, you know, you white folks say they, 
they're American. Mm -hmm. But the only time they say they're white is when they come back into the United States. Mm -hmm. Only time we say we're black is when we come into the United mm -hmm. States. Outside of the United States, um, there, there are no minority classifications in terms of business. So One World Products, why did we choose to cultivate and grow in Colombia? Uh, the same reason we chose France for champagne, the soil, the sun, uh, and also the, the farmers and the workers that you work with in terms of the indigenous farmers and growers. Mm -hmm. Colombia right now, uh, we've partnered with the Afro-Columbia uh, community there, uh, been granted 1.2 million acres of land to grow industrial hemp, so we're in industrial hemp space. And we're also in the THC and CBD space uh, there also. Um, we... Um, we're in the process. I, I got a couple of confidentiality agreements signed, so I got to keep my fingers mm -hmm. crossed. But we're in the process of onboarding uh, two of the larger brands here in the U.A. in the U.S. Uh, who sell CBD and THC products. Now, we can't distribute THC products across the across the border yet, but internationally, uh, as you know, the borders have opened up in other countries, mm -hmm. uh, so we can move THC and CBD products uh, into other countries. The U.S. will open up mm -hmm. THC-wise. Uh, it has opened up CBD-wise, so we're able to move product into the, into the U.S. on the CBD and the CBD oils uh, standpoint. The industrial hemp side, we uh, work with the uh, automotive industry. Uh, just signed an agreement with Stellantis and uh, Flexingate uh, to produce a part on the Jeep Wrangler that they've given us uh, that we, in, in the automobile space, they want to reduce their carbon footprint. Hemp is a natural carbon sink, so it takes carbon out of the air. And what we've done in that company, One World Product, is that we position ourselves uh, not only to be the largest supplier of industrial hemp, uh, but if you, if you think of, um, how can I put it, uh, most companies are set up to deal with corporations. We set ourselves up to deal with industry changes. So as, as plastics are moved out of the industry, uh, you're looking for the next raw material that will be infused into the industry. And we see industrial hemp being the replacement for plastics and also reducing the carbon footprint. Um, you Both of you know the discovery of the endocannabinoid system uh, that was discovered in the 90s. Had we known about it when we was playing, mm -hmm. I'm sure we would have treated ourselves differently. Uh, much differently. You know, they, uh, when you talk about CBD and, and THC, the two things that it does for athletes, right, reduces inflammation yep. and help you sleep. Yeah. That's all, <laughs> That's all we need. That's all we need. Two things we need. No, no, no swelling, no pain. No I nothing. can go to sleep. You yeah. know, it, so um, I, I think, uh, you know, the plant is going to change the way medicine is prescribed. Mm -hmm. um, they're now teaching in medical school now uh, about the endocannabinoid mm -hmm. system, CB1, CB2 mm -hmm. receptors. Uh, and the more we discover the benefits of the plant, the more it will be used. Now, you, you hit on an important topic in terms of, um, you know, classified as black in this country getting business opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get it on, on the first blush, the first go around. Uh, now that uh, federal and state still haven't come together in terms of their laws, um, in the dispensary model uh, that's set up here in the states, you can only cultivate and grow from you can only buy from the cultivators mm -hmm. within the state, but you can't cross state lines. Mm -hmm. So it's an it's a antiquated business model that's been set up here. We do believe that uh, it will have to expand and open up. And once it expands, like any product, and it's, you can globally buy it, buy it and supply it, uh, we see ourselves in Colombia uh, being a unique trade partner with the U.S., um, probably the biggest trade partner with the U.S. on this side of the equator. Uh, most of your flowers that you get come from Colombia here in the U.S., your coffee, your bananas, a lot of fruit. Uh, so as a trade partner, Colombia is one of your biggest trade partners. Colombia is projected to, to supply 44% of the world's cannabis supply only because of the, the geography and also uh, because you can turn your land over three times a year. 
So again, that's that's what we do in in One World Products in terms of. So I'm in the champagne space, uh, and I'm in the cannabis space, and my kids love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. Dad, hey, Dad is the plug. Yeah, yeah, hey, dad, <laughs> dad, is, dad is popping. Dad my is the kids plug. Love it. I'm <laughs> that's dope. <laughs> It's the last week in March, and you know what that means? A college basketball champion will be crowned in Houston soon. The tournament is almost over, but there's still time to win big with DraftKings Sportsbook, today's video sponsor. Sign up today using promo code SMOKE and start cooking up some bets. DraftKings Sportsbook is offering all new customers $150 in bonus bets if they pregame money line wager of $5 cashes. That sounds like a great way to start your betting journey. You can turn $5 into $150 in bonus bets if one pick cashes. There's no better place to feel the heat of the tournament than DraftKings Sportsbook. If mobile sports betting is not available in your state, don't worry. You can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they offer cash contests for nearly every sport. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any pregame money line wager and get $150 in bonus bets if your bet hits. That's promo code SMOKE. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Once you clock off work on Friday, head over to DraftKings Sportsbook app and see the All the Smoke Same Game Parlay. We'll be cooking up a new Same Game Parlay every Friday. So ride with All the Smoke, fam. The action only happens at DraftKings Sportsbook. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I started taking Athletic Greens because I wanted more energy. And I have to say, I simply love it. I take Athletic Greens in the morning before I start my day, and it makes me feel like I'm doing something good for my body, like I'm giving my body the nutrition it craves. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotic, adaptogens to help you start your day. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. That's why it tastes so good. It supports a better sleep quality, recovery, and also supports mental clarity and alertness. It's comprehensive health and the power of habit in one. AG1 is a great recovery, and I love taking mine before I work out or even after if I need a boost. AG1 empowers the gut and whole body health and inspires me to be as great as the athletes I'm a fan of. AG1 is so much more than a green powder. It's all your key health products in one. Covering my nutritional basis for a day literally couldn't be easier. And that's why I trust Athletic Greens. I just mix one small scoop of AG1 in water and drink it first thing in the morning each day. Done. I also like it because it costs less than $3 a day. Pretty good if you ask me. It's a really effective daily habit with the highest quality sourced ingredients. It's a win-win. If a comprehensive solution is what you need for your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash smoke. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash smoke. Check it out. Let's go back, man. I'm I'm a West Sider. No, you a West Sider. Absolutely. Uh talk about uh young Zeke growing up on the west side of Chicago. It was it was um it was hard. And as a matter of fact, you were you were just uh there um, I think a about a year ago, yeah. you was running around and... and o Block. Yeah, and I was like, I, was like, and I got the calls, right? I was like, nah, he good. Appreciate you looking out for me. I called Al, I said, Al, let him know now. <laughs> I was out there roving too. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, but uh, growing up on the west side of Chicago, and we, we emphasize west side, and, and, and here's why, because... Uh, my mom worked for Fred Hampton, and I was one of the kids that got the free breakfast, um, you know, learned martial arts and all that. And, and the Black Panther headquarters was right there on Madison and Western. The Chicago Bulls, the stadium was two blocks from Madison and Western where we, you know, you go to United mm-hmm. Center now or uh, what we call the, the, the stadium. It was two blocks from there. Uh, so, as a kid, I was standing outside the stadium begging for shoes, you know, and then they would throw the popcorn out after the game, and they would put it in the trash bin, so we would always, you know, wait and get the popcorn and, and, and take it home. But growing up on the west side, right, um, you had Noble Drew Ali teaching, uh, Moorish Americans, and, and at that time, it was about nationality, right? And you and I have had some conversations mm-hmm. about, 
you know, nationality and citizenship. That's what we were all about on the west side of Chicago. When Martin Luther King moved into the west side of Chicago, lived four blocks just from my house. There's a street named after my mom in Chicago. My mom was, she was a gangster, you know. She was, <laughs> she was, she was the real deal, yeah. you know. So Holman and Jackson, you'll see Mary Thomas Way. Uh, and, you know, named after my mom. You know, we marched in all the civil rights movements. Mm. Um, you know, when Martin Luther King moved in, you know, we didn't have babysitters. It was nine of us, so she, you know, she would take us and, and you know, we had to go where her and my pops went, you know. And um, so that's kind of the neighborhood that, that I'm from. Um, you know, the the first original gang that started in the United States, the Vice Lords. Um, when you talk about the Vice Lords and, and, and all these gangs that really started, you know, they if they go back and they read their original charters, right? The original charters were set up, they were supposed to be community mm -hmm. Protecting the neighborhood. Base. Yeah, and they was protecting the neighborhood, and they was protecting the neighborhood from the police, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because there was a lot of police brutality. And, and, and we were fighting not to be colorized. We were fighting not to be put in an apartheid colorized system. And when you go back and you look, and it, you know, those signs that they was wearing in Memphis said, I, I am a man. You know, we were fighting not to be dehumanized and taken out of our humanity, right? We wanted to be and remain human. Uh, but now we, we've accepted and we've adopted this colorized system. Uh, but, but those were the teachings that were taught on the west side of Chicago. So that's where I come from. That's what's ingrained in me. That's what I carry. That's what I still fight for today. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no... There's no pure anything. We're all living on a hyphen, right? You, you, you know, you're Italian American, and I'm gonna say this, right? When we were growing up, we grew up with Italians, we grew up with Greeks, we grew up with Polish, we grew up with Irish, right? And they were proud to call themselves Greek, Italian, Irish, right? When did everybody become white? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, they don't say I'm, I'm Greek anymore. They don't say I'm Italian anymore. They don't say, you know, uh, I'm Jewish. They, everybody, it's either white, black, green, purple, blue, or orange. Mm -hmm. And we had a People conversation about that. Mm -hmm. right? My mom, I used to, you know, when I, what are you? I'm black and white. And my mom's like, no, you're Italian. You're Italian. Like, you're Italian. You're not, you're not white. Claim you're Italian, it. right? Right. Yeah. And, 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 and by the way, the Italians, you know, come from the Moors, right? You know, yep. so, you know, when you, when you, all, all of us are human beings, First and right? foremost, right. And, and if we can get back to being human beings yes. and get away from this colorized apartheid system that we're operating in, then we got a chance to make it. Mm. You know, and that's what the fight has always been about in this country, right? Those who, are, who have been classified as black have always been trying to get out of black status. Mm -hmm. So when immigrants come in, they quickly say, what's your status? And they tell you what their status is, right? And, you know, so nationality, birthright, citizenship, status, those are, those are the things that we need to be talking about. That was the conversation on the West Side, and that's the conversation I still carry today. Mm. One quick one um, question. Uh, you said you and your mom used to take you out to the marches and yeah. stuff like that. I got a chance to experience that with George Floyd. Did any of that change you experience that? Like, did that have like any type of hold on you to be able to experience that as a youngster? Because I experienced it as a grown man, and it yeah. definitely changed me. Yeah, and 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 so two things that that I noticed dramatically. So when we were marching. You know, in the 60s, uh, my, my first 10 years of life, right? Uh, Martin Luther King's assassinated. Fred Hampton's assassinated. Uh, the Kennedys are assassinated. And we're talking 63, 65, then the Cicero riots, Chicago riots, 66, 67. So this is my first 10 years of life on the West Side. So I, I've like seven riots, <laughs> you know, all in all community, right? And... And it was just the, the community in the city marching, right? George Floyd gets killed. And I watched all the pain that you was going through. And I, we all cried mm -hmm. for you and felt for you and, and saw your heart on display for your brother, right? And 
But the thing that that was so different about George Floyd and us marching for voting rights, I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, in this country, we still marching and trying to get voting rights. Think about what I'm saying, right? Classified as white in this country, they ain't never had to march for voting rights, right? Equal rights, uh, key word. Civil rights. Civil I rights. just need you to be civil to me. Mm-hmm. So I'm, and these are these are these are terms. Asking these are labels, civil. right? These are labels. Civil rights, equal rights, voting rights, right? So George Floyd gets you know gets murdered, and watching all the pain that you was going through, but then seeing the whole world. Whoa. That's different. It's different now. Mm-hmm. The, the whole world stood up and was marching. Those who were classified as black, white, different countries. And, and what they were saying is, hey, United States of America, these people that y'all have classified as black, please stop doing this to them. Change these laws. Let them be human, right? Give them their nationality back. Let them be a part of the, the system, right? And, and that was different, you know, where the world stood up. And not only did the world stand up, but you had black folk, white folk, green folk, everybody orange together, folk. Everybody together. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody. And, and, and the sustained movement of the young folk. The young folk in this country mm-hmm. was like, hey, I, I don't know what y'all talking about, but I like Snoop. <laughs> you know what I mean? We ain't budging. We I ain't like budging. Jay, you know, I like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, you know, this is my brother. This is my, right. and, and, and so the young folk, what they've done in this country, and I hope they keep it up, is putting the pressure on to, to, to let us become a part of the United States American fabric and and we don't need no 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 you know <laughs> we classified as a minority when you look these terms up in the dictionary right hey these words have meaning right so hey I'm I'm not a minority I'm a grown man right right I can right. take care of myself pay my own bills you know I'm not a handicapped individual and don't classify my business as handicapped. You know, treat me, you know, level the playing field. We come from sport and all we ask for is, hey man, just the referees mm-hmm. don't cheat like they cheated for fair. the Lakers. <laughs> 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 no call no call the phantom foul, you know. You know call it fair, you know that. <laughs> keep it even, keep it even now. Give us a chance. So sorry I went off on that. Nah, that's all good. Again. That's why I asked. That's why I asked y'all. You had me. I was about to let some down. Um, yeah, I saw them tears coming. Yeah, in they your were coming, eyes, man. Just, but but you said, saying, man. But that's you said some deep stuff, man. Y'all did it. I mean, y'all and y'all doing it, and we need y'all to keep doing it. Mm, appreciate it. You know, let's let's uh, stay on the west side. Let's talk about Lord Henry. Oh, how man. how big was he in your life, and how nice was he, man? So my older brother, Lord Henry, right, um, and so. I think he may still hold a, the Catholic school scoring record. Went to St. Phillips. And, um, you know, when we talk about George Gervin, right, I didn't know George Gervin back then. And back then, the NBA wasn't on TV like the NBA is on TV now. So you only admired your, your, the people in your neighborhood or your older the brothers. The locals. Or, yeah, the locals. And every now and then, you may, you may hear about Dr. J., and in your imagination, you mm-hmm. this is a Dr. J move, but mm-hmm. you ain't never really seen him, right? Um, but my brother Lord Henry was so smooth, man. And the I mean, name alone, you had to be called a name yeah, like Lord Henry. Yeah, Lord. yeah, yeah. You know, I, my mom and my dad, they had high hopes for yeah. us, you know. <laughs> and of course, the, the place that we was living in, yeah, you know, that's you know, that's 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 how it was. But um, but no, and. And and he got turned out though, you know. He he got turned out on heroin. Um, ended up dying, uh, you know, several years ago. But but man, you're talking about a pretty jump shot, you know, between the leg dribbles behind the back, 
And the way I was taught to play the game and the way he taught me to play the game, it, it was all spiritual. You know, it was like, and I can I can remember him and my older, my, my second oldest brother, well, third oldest brother, Larry, you know, it's like, Junior, you know, you, you just can't play the game. You, you got to feel it. I mean, you got to, when you shake, you, you got to feel it, man. Mm-hmm. You just can't, you just dribbling. Mm-hmm. What, the, what the fuck is that? You just dribbling, man. <laughs> Looking you, like a robot. Yeah, you just, you, <laughs> you got to feel it, man. And, and so you, that's how, I, you know, you tried to play. You, you tried to put that spirituality into the game where you try to make that person who's watching you play feel what you mm. feel, right? And so my brother Lord Henry, you know, he, like I say, he died of heroin. But the one thing, you know, he kicked, right? And I remember when he kicked, you know, and he said, I'm going to go back to school. Um, and, <laughs> and while he kicked, he was like, damn, you know, it was... It was, it was easier when I was on drugs, <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. now now you got to get back into the system. You've been out of the system for a long time. But he went back, graduated from college, and I'll never forget. So you've been on the West Side, right? We uh, his gra- The night before graduation, I rented a bus, and the bus was meeting on Fifth Avenue in Jackson, right? And, and he was graduating from... Uh, uh, school in, in Detroit, uh, Univ- what's it, Phoenix University, mm-hmm. you know that. University online, of Phoenix. Yeah, mm-hmm. that online thing. So um, so I rented a bus, and I had the bus, you know, show up on Fifth Avenue in Jackson at 4 in the morning. 3 in the morning, I want everybody to be there at 3 in the morning. Bus going to leave at 4, going down to Detroit so we can watch Lord Henry graduate at 4 Field. And i never forget, bus driver called me up like, Hey man, you you sure I got the right address? You sure I'm in the right location? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, you're in the right location. So anyway, all of Lord Henry's friends, you know, some are still addicts. Um, then some, you know, you know, I've kicked and everything. So we load up the bus. And as the bus gets loaded up, now they drive down to Detroit. I meet him in Detroit and we had his graduation. And I never forget, man, like my brother walking across the stage, had his cap and gown on. He didn't know where we was gonna be there. And and all his friends started hollering, Lord Henry! Lord Henry! And man, he broke down on the stage and just started crying, like yeah. crying like a little baby, man. That was that was one of the most beautiful days that I remember. So when you talk about Lord Henry, he has basketball playing, but the fact that that dude went back to school mm. and then he just died a couple of years ago, you know, his organs just shut down all up, the heroin mm-hmm. and stuff. It just, body just collapsed. But mm. Rest in peace. Condolences, yeah. man. Yeah, man. yeah. yeah. Yes, thanks man. for bringing him up. Nah, mm-hmm. man, Thank for you. sure, man. Thank for you. sure, mm-hmm. man. I, I just lost my little brother. I lost my older brother when I was young too, so... I know the feeling. You yeah. Know, I know the feeling. Yeah. Uh, Chicago Pipeline. All the, especially now, all the young players that's coming out of Chicago, man. Um, what's in the water, though? You got D Wade, Anthony Davis, Kevin Garnett, Derrick Rose, Tim Hardaway, Antoine yeah. Walker, yourself, uh, uh, Will Bynum, Patrick Beverly. You got so many, yeah. so many hoopers yeah. come from there. All dogs. Yeah. All dogs. Yeah. Talk about what's in the water. Well, it's in Detroit water now, too. Yeah. So I claim Chicago and, <laughs> and Detroit. Detroit. Okay. All right, all right, all right. All right. That's a lot. So, cool cities. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, 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 but, you know, for us, right, is, so we always say the South Side, like them South Side guys you name, they all got haircuts. You know, they pretty, you yeah. know what I mean? They, Fly. They, and, they, and they can shoot, yeah. right? West Side, we... We D and up. Yeah. Okay. We, so we Patrick Beverly, we Tony Allen. Tony Allen. We yeah. Isaac, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we I mean we 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 picking you up ninety four feet, we getting in your face. Tim Hardaway, you know, them South Side dudes, Dwayne Wade, they can score. Man. Yeah. I mean they can they can score the basketball. So it's it's like we and then they got a lot of food over there too. <laughs> <laughs> they got a lot of food. We, we didn't have as much food, but but I would say just what's in the water it Again, it's the spirituality of, you know, wanting to be the best and wanting to compete. And 
the guy that we the probably the most proud of out of Chicago is Derrick Rose. Rose. Yeah. I mean, hey man, he he lived all of our dream, all of our dream, right? And then he plays for the Chicago Bulls, mm, right? Hometown. Right on. And then he becomes the youngest MVP of the that. league at 20. Oh man! I mean, felt it. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's like, you know, when D Rose walk into the room, it's like, you know, theme music be playing. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, so you know, again, it, it's just a, I think it's competition, right? We, we want to compete. Mm -hmm. A lot of us really like to fight. Don't say we win all our fights. Right, right? nobody does. Yeah, I, I, like I grew up fighting. I had to fight like twice a week. I didn't win all my fights. But then you just start like fighting, right? Mm -hmm. And you just be like, all right, you know. Part of it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think in Chicago, that's, that's part of like the get down. Now in Detroit. So I, you know, when you look at what I, the way I grew up and the way I learned how to play in Chicago, what I tried to do is take that to Detroit. So when you look at the Chris Webbers, you look at the Derek Coleman's, you look at the Jalen Rose, you look at the Steve Smith, you look at, you know, them, we all bring that same, like, mm -hmm. okay, we, we, we coming with it. And mm -hmm. if you don't like it, I'm sorry, you know. We can Ronnie Fields, too. I forgot to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ronnie yeah, Fields, that's yeah. the name I forgot. That's my classmate. Yeah. Man, mm -hmm. if he wouldn't have gotten that accident, bro. Yeah. People don't remember, like, so KG, right? People talk about Kevin Garnett, but in Chicago, they say Kevin Garnett played with Ronnie, Ronnie Fields. Ronnie I'm Fields. To, I say that all you the time, OG. It's like he played with Ronnie, Ronnie. Fields. But man, and, and you talking about somebody jumping high, right? <laughs> so when KG first got to Chicago, right, you know, KG liked to talk, and, you know, he, he real animated, right? And he want to play everywhere, like everywhere. And... And so he going up in the gym, and, and, and so everybody like, hey, man, who is this dude, man? He, he kind of talk a lot, you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> I was like, nah, man, he good, man, he good. <laughs> like, leave, leave him alone. And, and, and so KG, like, went all over Chicago playing. But as you say, he's the guy that played with Ronnie Fields. Ronnie Fields mm -hmm. was the right? truth, man. And, and it's like Dwayne Wade in Chicago, right? Dwayne Wade get mad love, but he don't get the 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 Ronnie Fields kind of love mm -hmm. in Chicago. Because in Chicago, it's what you did in high school. Yeah. If you if you was the man in high school, you the man for life. In Chicago, mm -hmm. yeah. In Chicago, it, yeah. Yeah. We we don't have a more decorated athlete that come out of Chicago than Dwayne Wade. Mm -hmm. Dwayne Wade is like the gold standard, you know. Olympics, gold medal, championships, mm -hmm. everything. No, no one has got more, you know, mm -hmm. decorations than Dwayne Wade. But in Chicago, oh man, Ron Field, man, <laughs> right. Right. man G Rose, you know what I mean? It's like, Them too. Man, yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's how it go. You know, mm. it's like what you did, you know, in high school is what mm. matters. That's crazy. Uh, you end up choosing Indiana for college. Who else was on your uh, list? No, nah, I didn't choose Indiana. Okay, my we'll mother, talk to us. My, my mom chose children. Indiana. <laughs> well, talk to us about where you're, who was recruiting you and, and where you wanted to go. So, um, of course, I wanted to stay at home and go to DePaul. Uh, and then my second choice was Iowa with Lou Olson. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so Coach Rosborough was the assistant coach at, at Iowa. And he actually coached my brother, Lord Henry and Gregory, at Our Lady of Sorrows. So if you go back and you look at Iowa, Lute Olsen always had Chicago guards, you know, from Ronnie Lester to uh, Kenny Arnold. I mean, so he had that Chicago pipeline, Kevin Boyle, Jim Stack, and he was able to get all them because he had Rosborough, who had coached on the west side. So... Um, I wanted to go to DePaul, wanted to stay home. And at that time, we were, we were poor and poor, you know. No lights, no gas, no food, you know, struggling every day. And, you know, at that time, people was offering you money to come to school. And i never forget, you know, had I, had I stayed home in Chicago, things would have been really nice for the family. 
I don't know if I would be alive today, mm. though, if I would have stayed home in Chicago. And and y'all can understand this. And, I, and I've never really said this, um, but growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in and growing up the way we grew up, uh, my mom made the wise decision and said, you know, you're going to go to Indiana. Uh, had I stayed in Chicago, I don't know if, um, you know, running the, running around doing the things that we were doing. Caught up to you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but she chose Indiana for me, you know. Legend has it that when Bob Knight showed up, the whole neighborhood showed up. The whole neighborhood showed up, and and then there was a fight almost that broke out too. <laughs> <laughs> so my so my uh, so my two older brothers, you know, all my brothers were there, um, and my second oldest brother Gregory. Um, and I'm sure you heard about my second oldest brother Gregory. Uh, so he so he asked Coach Knight the question. You know, it's like you know, you know, Coach, like if. If Junior was to, you know, go down to Indiana, you know, we we know the Klan is is right there. And if something was to go down, you know, who, who's going to look out for Junior? And I thought Coach Knight gave a, you know, a pretty slick answer. You know what I mean? He's like, you know, well, if, if we're winning, then they're going to look out. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, if we're losing, you know, and you know, everybody kind of laughed it off, but my brother, he, he didn't, took it he didn't like, like that. he didn't like that answer. Mm -hmm. Now, and so so back up. So Coach Knight, when he come to visit me, he walk in with Wayne Embry and Quinn Buckner. Now, Quinn Buckner, you know, undefeated, you know, at Thorn Ridge, undefeated at Indiana, and and Wayne Embry. First black general manager, you know, in Milwaukee. Now he walk in, he flanked with them, right? And he coming to recruit me. So big respect walking through the door. So my brother didn't like his answer, right? And and so my brother, you know, my brother was lit at the time. I mean, he was, you know, that's just how they was, mm -hmm. right? And so my brother was like, hey, man, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. You know, that, what you mean they going to take care of mm -hmm. we? We take care of Junior, you know, mm -hmm. and and so the conversation quickly got heated, and you know I, you know the voices raised and everything else, and and so everybody's like, no, no, y'all calm down, no, I did it, and so Coach Knight stood up, you know, my brother's like, well, we can take this outside, so Coach Knight stood up and took off his jacket. Start rolling up his sleeves, like, like, yeah, we could take this outside. And everybody's like, no, 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 no. And so I look over there, and my mom, right, my mom just sitting there real quiet, kind of nodding her head, doing like this. And I'm like, oh, she liked this dude. She liked it. Oh, no. She falling no, no. for it, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, man, uh, I'm glad they didn't go outside. Because he was going to get jumped. Oh, he 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 wouldn't have made, <laughs> made it back in. He wouldn't have made it back in. I like I, I like the it. thought, but yeah, 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 that ain't what you want, nah, coach. Nah, nah, he he thought it was just gonna be a one on one thing. Nah, he wouldn't have made it back in. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, he would have got stuck up first. Yeah, he <laughs> that <laughs> stuck he up did, first, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he he wouldn't have made it back in. You know, <laughs> for sure. I remember I remember Bobby Knight called me my senior year. Um, he called my he called my house. My mom answered the phone. She was talking to him. She's like, "Hold on, I'm gonna put you on speakerphone." This was his exact words. Do you want to come to Indiana or not? Right? <laughs> Straight up, bro. I'm like, huh? I'm like, I'm looking at my mom. I'm like, I don't know what to say. She's like, excuse me. Yeah. Do you want to come to Indiana or not? And she's like, well, we'll have to give you a call back because she wasn't expecting to be so blunt. Mm -hmm. And that's all he said, bro. Yeah. That was it. Never heard from him again. That was recruiting trip. Do you want to come to Indiana or not? Yeah. That's it. No, he 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 was straight <laughs> gangster it. with it. Mm. He walked up in the house and said, "Look, I'm off your son three things, Miss Thomas. Now this is me sitting here, right? He said, Miss Thomas, I'm ask, I'm off of your son three things. He's gonna be a gentleman, graduate from college, and I'm gonna teach him how everything I know about basketball." And I'm like, well, that 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 ain't enough. That ain't <laughs> it. Uh. That ain't <laughs> it. Where, where the money at? You know what I mean? He's like. And, but, you know, that's how he recruited. And the thing that, the thing that, that my mom 
and I would say my sister, that they, they really loved that I didn't understand at that time. What Coach Knight was doing in the 70s and a little bit of the 80s, taking young, classified as black men, young boys in the United States of America, taking them down to Bloomington, Indiana, bookend by the Klan, right? Everybody graduated from college. Everybody's doing well. Everybody won championships. Mm. And he didn't cheat. And he didn't cheat. And he didn't cheat. And that was unheard of during that period of time. Because going to college, you was going to take basket weaving, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't, didn't have to go to class, somebody was going to be doing your homework. Everybody who graduated from Indiana, you went to school, you did your homework, and you got a real grade. Mm -hmm. He prepares you. Know? you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You. How long did it take for you to buy in, though? I mean, obviously, oh, I didn't basketball. Buy in. <laughs> Shit, I, <laughs> never, I, never, I never bought in. He compromised. I, I had, you know, it was like, hey, man, this is how it's going to be. Like, you know, it is what it is. Wasn't no place to go. You know, I, I got kicked off the team a couple of times, and and I was like, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going home. But then I remember, wasn't no lights at home, wasn't no food at home, wasn't no gas at home. So, and you weren't getting no sympathy from your mom. Your mom was like, you know, you got to stay there. So, but uh, the thing that I, the thing that I loved about Coach Knight, now that I'm older, is that he had the courage to coach me. He had the courage to have confrontation with me. He had the courage to make me do right when I, I wanted to be wrong, right? He didn't let me slide. He didn't let me get by. And it would have been easier for him to do that now mm -hmm. that I'm looking back because I was pretty good at the time, but I didn't know how good I was as a player, right? So he let me, you know, he he basically was like, no, nah, you 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 got to go to class, man. If you don't go to class, you you can't come to practice. You can't lay in your bed all day and think you're going to come to practice and then go to class. That, that That ain't happening. Now, of course, that's what I wanted to do. That's what we all wanted to do. Um, so, and then in terms of freedom, right? Like we had no plays at Indiana. We didn't have out of bounds play. We weren't coming down calling play 22 up, 32 out, you know. One, it was like, no, you got to get to know your teammate. And once you get to know your teammate, then you'll know if he's going left or right. But we played this, this game they call passing game, similar to what Golden State does now. Now, Steve Kerr comes from the, you know, he comes from the, the coaching tree, right? Lute Olsen. Um, you know, when you look at Lute Olsen, when you look at Pop, you know, all of them really have, you know, similar coaching trees and thinking philosophies very similar to night, right? So that passing game, that 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 um, that know your teammate, understand what your teammate's gonna do, uh, you know how we're gonna attack the opponent, how we're gonna dissect him. Uh, some some teams only enter the ball on the left side of the court. Ah, uh, well tonight you're gonna end it on the right side. <laughs> you know, um, so that was the way he made you think and play. Uh, so, he made you think the game. Yeah, and he always said it's a thinking man's game. Yep. Mental is the physical as four is to one. And, you know, if you can't think, then you, you, you got no shot against playing against me. Mental is to physical as four is to one? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, it, it, it's a thinking man's game. And you, you have to think your way through the game. And You're going to have him thinking about that analogy the whole, yeah, the yeah, whole show. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, Two-year pit stop. You won a champion, national championship in 81, dropped 23 versus uh, Sam Perkins and James Worthy over in North Carolina. What was your favorite on-the-court moments in college? Was it, was it that championship? Uh, two favorites. Uh, the first favorite was um, February 14th 
in Iowa, Mike Whitson's return because my freshman year he had back surgery. We were ranked number one. Whitson goes down. Uh, Whitman goes down. Bushy goes down. And we like, you know, we faltering, right? Uh, Whitson comes back. And that's his first game, and it's in Iowa City. And this is my freshman year. And my whole my whole time now, you know, playing for Coach Knight, I'm waiting for this genius moment, right? I'm waiting for him to grab the clipboard, you know, and draw up some stuff. And But I ain't seen no clipboard in, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't seen the clipboard, like, since I got there, right? So we down... We down one in Iowa. It was Woody's first game back, and and we called timeout. And now I'm like, okay, this this the moment. Something got to happen. I, I, I know we getting ready to drop a play now, right? This was the play. <laughs> he said, Whitson, can you make a shot? <laughs> Woody said, yeah, I'll knock it down, coach. He said, all right, he called me Pee Wee. He said, okay, Pee Wee, I want you to move the ball around. Tobert, I want you to set a screen for Woodson. Woodson, I want you to get open. Pee Wee, when he gets open, I want you to hit it. Woody knocked the shot down. I'm like, on the left side, the right side? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, where, 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 where is Woodson going to be at? <laughs> you know? I'm scared. I'm, I'm like scared. I'm like walking out on the floor. I'm like, okay, how are we going to get the ball in, right? He, he, want, he wants you to put everybody in place. I'm like, hey, man, just... All I'm doing, so I, I I pass it, then I run over there and get it. <laughs> I got pass it. And so I'm waiting for Woody to come. Woody come off. Tober sets a down screen. Whitson comes off on the left side. I hit him. Boom, boom. And he banks it right off the glass. And, and to me, that was the most, that was one of the most beautiful moments I have experienced because he, Woody recruited me. That was my senior. Mm-hmm. He had back surgery. You know, he was coming back, you know. And so I was like, okay. Second best moment was, you know, be North Carolina in that final game. Uh, so two things happened in that game um, in the first half. North Carolina got out to a good start. And I, I knew we didn't have the talent to play with them, right? Talent for talent, they were better. James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Al Wood, that's their back line. Worthy was a number one pick. I think Perkins was like, you know, five or six, and Al Will was like 10 or something. Um, but North Carolina, they played that platoon system. So I was just, they got up, and I was like, okay, we just got to hold on, fellas, because five minutes, they're going to take Worthy out. <laughs> they're going to take Worthy and Perkins out, and when they took them out, it's on. that's when we was able to come back. But one of the biggest plays, I thought, in that game, um, Clock's running down. We got the last shot of the half. And Whitman's in the in the, in the right corner. And I'm standing there. We're, you know, I'm I'm dribbling the ball, trying to, you know, make sure like everybody is, is set, doing what they're supposed to do, trying to stall time. And Whitman and I make eye contact. And, you know, we run the clock down, kick it over to Whitman. He knocks down a shot to end the shot in the first half. That gave us crazy momentum going in because I think we either went up one or was down one. We come back out the third, uh, start the second half, and then I take over. Mm-hmm. So you know that, but I thought that shot was one of the biggest the moments catapult. in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nineteen eighty one draft, you go number two overall to the Pistons, probably the worst team in the league before you got there. Well, yeah. You knew what you was walking into, though, right? No, I didn't. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I didn't sign up for this shit. I, I, I like, you see his face? Like, like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Nah, I, you know, when you hear the worst team, you know, you you don't, you have no idea what the worst team. What that's like. Yeah, what they really mean, right? You, so, um, there, so there was no culture. There was no, now I come from every place I've, been, I've won, mm-hmm. right? And and so there, there's rules, there's 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 discipline, there's a way of acting, there's a way of being, there's a way of doing things. Um, and 
And so when I get to Detroit, those, it was like, what are we doing? Like, how, how are we going to win? That's all I'm trying to figure out is how are we going to win? And so I had to go to school, right? And where I went to school, I went to the Lakers school and I went to the Celtics school. So I started following them around. And fortunately enough for me, Magic Johnson, who had just come off winning the NBA championship and being the MVP of the championship game, now he like, he like, come on, man, you with me. And I'm like, mm. really? I'm with you. <laughs> he like, yeah. So we, so now I'm 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 watching the Lakers. I'm watching him. And I'm watching how how they train, how they practice, how they come together. Kevin McHale and I were friends, uh, you know, since high school, played on the Pan Am team together. So now I get to, you know, I watch how Boston do things. ML Carr, you know, still talk mm-hmm. with him today. You know, Maxwell. I mean, so so the Celtics and the Lakers really like let me like in their locker room. You look at all their championship celebrations. In the 80s, you'll see Isaiah Thomas in them locker rooms. That's crazy. Watching them celebrate, Damn. right? Mm. Um, you know, on their exit meetings. I'm, I'm with Magic at the exit meetings, you know, when they lost to Boston. Like in the room with In them? the fucking room. That's crazy. Right? What? I'm, I'm, listening, no like I'm listening to Pat Riley, you know, give his thing. Jerry West, who's still my man today, right? Jerry West. That's crazy. They, they let me in to the... The sanctuary. I I was one of them, right? And and so I learned. And and so in learning, not only did it make me better, but it I was able to bring some things back to the Pistons in terms of, hey, if we want to win in this league, this is what it looked like. This is mm-hmm. what it looked like. Say that again. This is what it looked this like. This is what it looked like, yes, right? Because we had no idea. So so it's like, okay. How are you going to win in this league? You 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 got to learn. You got to get educated, right? And and they let me in. And, and so, so I'm there when Magic Johnson dribble out the shot clock, and they calling him Tragic Johnson, right? And I'm in his hotel room, me, Mark, and and this dude laying on the floor, bawling. I mean, just. Hurt, crying, uh, you know, just, you know, that <gasps> kind of cry, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and, and we stayed up with him until, you know, bus was leaving at 5, 5.30 in the morning. And he just laying on the floor just bawling, right? Come down the escalator, get on the bus, go back to L.A. So I get a chance to watch all that. I get a chance to see James Worthy, right? Take the ball out on the sideline inbound it. Gerald Henderson steals it, mm. right? He goes laser. So I get to see all their heartbreak, but I also get to see that bounce back. I get to see that bounce back, right? And so when Magic lost, right, now that summer, we, we training, we working out, and that dude shot me with so many bowls, right? And finally, I just had to say, hey, look, man, I'm I'm not Larry Bird. You got to cut this shit out. What the fuck? You know what I mean? <laughs> but, I mean, he was training so hard. And so now Mark and I, we going through all our stuff, right? That summer, that dude shot maybe 1,000 free throws a day. And I'm like, why are you shooting so many free throws? Like, what? Come on, man, you know, work on your jump shot. You know, you got to get your J right now. That dude went from being an 83, 84% jump to 90. Wow. Jumped to 90% from the foul line. Then became the MVP of the league. Mm. <laughs> That's big. You know what I mean? So so watching that and, and learning that, so when you say now the Detroit Pistons, so... We didn't have no culture. So what did I do, right? It's like, okay, this is who we are. We, we need an identity. This is who we're going to become. This is how we're going to dress. This is how we're going to talk. This is how we're going to look, right? And, and then bringing some stuff from the neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that 10-point that, that program, 
right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like we're going we gonna to instill this into our team, yeah. right? There's going to be some rules. This is how we're going to follow. This is how we're going to act. This is how we're going to march. This is how we're going to be. Mm -hmm. This is who we are in this NBA league. And still today, this is who we are. This is what we do. Now, if we didn't establish that, that culture, that language, that belief system, those values, you know, we, we didn't have the type of talent that L.A. had. We didn't have the type of talent that Boston had. Mm -hmm. But we had a belief system that was so strong that this going to mess you up when I say this. Bill Lambeer believed that he can compete every single night against Kareem Abdul Jabbar. It's a strong belief. <laughs> Come on, work with me. That is. Work with me. Think, think, think about what yeah. I just said. Yeah. Think about what I just said. Yeah, the zone out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it, it's like that, that in itself, right? L Lambeer walking out on the floor with the belief and understanding that number 33 in purple or number 33 in gold, if I do what I'm supposed to do, I can beat you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the world would agree with him. <laughs> Nobody. The and they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. They and didn't. by the way, they still don't believe it. I know. I'm just glad the film don't lie. Mm. Film don't lie. Mm. Never we did. just had Barkley on, and Barkley was talking about around the time you come in how Bird and Magic saved the league. Do you agree with that? I think Bird and Magic uh, saved the league, and I think the league took off when the Detroit Pistons showed up on the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think Bird and Magic, you know, what the NBA was coming out of in the 70s um, and and how the United States was. I mean, we have to talk about that now. How the United States was for, for black men in the 70s um, and then Bird and Magic being on the stage in the, in the early 80s coming out of college and then, you know, playing that, you know, that game again. Uh, Magic coming to L.A., Bird going to Boston. You know, they walked into culture. They walked into foundation. They walked into a way of being. They mm -hmm. walked into winning. They didn't have to, you know, get a piece of paper and go to school and get Created, educated. Right. They walked into it, right? right? Now, that helped. But what the ratings say and what the numbers say, when the league took off, is when them bad boys from the Detroit Pistons showed up because we showed up with a totally different kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. we, we had, you know, people from all different walks of life, and we started putting 50, 60,000 people in the Silver Dome. Mm, that's a big ass and, stadium. And then we had three rivalries. I think we're the only team that only had three rivalries. The Lakers, the Celtics, and the Bulls, <laughs> right? So... Every time we played, every everywhere we moved, right? It was, it was different. And then we didn't understand, well, we didn't know. Um, so we met a gentleman by the name of Mike Ornstein with the L.A. Raiders, or the Oakland Raiders at that time. What they call cross marketing today. We didn't know there was such a term as cross marketing, but our connection with the Oakland Raiders, then let us start changing our colors. So we went from the red, white, and blue to the silver and black. And then we had a, 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 a second jersey. We had a second uniform. You know, and the NBA really didn't own any of that. So when we walked off the stage and the Bulls took, walked on the stage, that's when y'all got the shooting jerseys. That's when they started changing the, the, you know, the different color uniforms and everything mm. else. But the Pistons started all that. So the highest rated games in the 80s, Pistons against Celtics, Pistons against Lakers, Pistons against Bulls. And they all have one thing in common. Pistons. That's the Detroit Pistons. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's that attitude and energy y'all brought. First NBA game, 31 and 11. Ooh. Crazy first game, Ooh. 31 and 11. Jeez. Uh, you make the All-Star game as your rookie year, too. Clearly the leader of your team. Did that come to you naturally? Or like when you when you showed up, they knew you was leader, or did you have to fight for that? I I never 
thought of myself as the leader. I never thought of myself as the captain. Uh, it's, you know, um, leadership is, is given. You, you never walk into a room and be like, I'm, I'm the leader. You know, it's, they vote on it. You know, who's going to be the captain? Okay, you can be the captain. And, and I was selected the captain and the leader uh, only because they trust me, right? And, and that type of trust is earned, and then you have to honor it, too. Mm -hmm. Like, that means... Uphold it. Yep. Yeah, that means you can't go out when right. everybody else is going out. Right? <laughs> right? You oh, can't... I didn't mean... I didn't know it meant that much. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't do the things <laughs> right. that everybody else is doing. Because, you know, they, there's a certain amount of trust and respect that goes along with that. Yeah. Um, so that, that first game against Milwaukee, I'm playing against, you know, not Quinn Buckner. I'm playing against him. This is my first time playing against him. You know, that dude was just in my house. He went undefeated. He went undefeated in high school and undefeated in college. Still mm. the last undefeated team, right? Now I'm playing against him. And he like, hey, Junior, how you doing? I'm like, oh, fuck, this going to be a bad night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, and so I remember like the first two, three plays, I get by him. And I go down the lane. I go down the lane to make a layup. Come back down the lane again, and Bob Lanier, literally, I'm up in the air like this, and he goes, woof. Caught you in the air? Caught me in the air <laughs> and set me down mm -mm. and said, look, don't come down here no more. I was like, okay. My jump shot got real good. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big Cause, boy. Because when he when he Same called once. me, because when he called me, it wasn't you know when them guys hit you right. It wasn't like a a gentle whoop. You know, it was like mm, yeah. And they put that force behind them. And and that old you know, man strength. Dude, yeah, yeah, you feel that right? That old man strength. That dude set me down, man. And you know, but I I had a good game that night. Damn, but I was looking man. forward to the next night. So you talking about that thirty one and eleven? That next night, then we come home to play the Chicago Bulls. And that's I dropped 30 time. in that game. Oh. Now, that's the game that I really like. Yeah, yeah. Because now all my boys there. Everybody every, there. I mean, everybody there. You know, Red, Magic what's One. That, what's that trip every, from so Chicago to Boston? How long is that trip, bus or car? From Chicago to Detroit? Oh, excuse me, yeah. Oh, that's... It's four hours and it's three and a half. Mm -hmm. Depending, depending on, on how fast you're going. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Jack can get there at three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 245. So straight down 94. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, we go to Chicago. I can say Red, Magic Wand, all my brothers near them there. You know, all I mean, everybody up in the stands. You know, and my my mom and my, my aunt, like back then, they didn't have them, their metal detectors. So my mom... She believed in the Second Amendment now. She she, she packed. Piece, she huh? had yeah. everything. Yeah. Every yeah. 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 I was a real G. Yeah. yeah. And, Blinky. And my aunt got a switchblade. She carried a switchblade <laughs> in the wind. And you, and and I don't know if people remember this, but you know, like she would be sitting there talking, right? And you remember trick? They could do tricks with yeah, their switchblades. Yeah. Yes, you know. Yeah. And she yeah. likes you know be talking to you and like twirling it all around and <laughs> hitting it. And mm, nice with it. And close it up on you when they finish. And so they would bring food to the game. So they bring in their chicken and everything. And, you know, and so, and I'll never forget. So we, um, Ricky Sobers was the guard then. One number 14, top. Ricky Sobers. I played like at UNLV, Sobers. right? And, and so we, you know, I'm, I'm going through my stuff. I went between my legs and that dude like hit me so hard. Bam, right? Mm. You know, I, I fold it up, right? Because back then, you know, they didn't like when you try to show them off. Like, now you, you can just go through your legs and everything else for a long time. Back then, they stand you up. And so, um, <laughs> I say, hey, man, don't hit me like that no more. And, you know, what you going to do, you little, little punk? I say, okay. I say, you see all them people sitting up there? I say, you live here. I say, you hit me like that one more time. You won't live here no more. <laughs> Straight up. That's simple. That's simple. And, and you know, was, we had a good game. Yeah. You know, winning. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up winning. <laughs> he paid attention. Uh, no, come 85, right. the year Jordan enters the league. At the time, the East is loaded. Yourself, Matt, uh, MJ, Bird, Dominique, 
Moses Malone, Charles Barkley, Dr. J. Mm. Um, mm. What was the Eastern Conference back in the middle of the 80s like every night? You see, I just took a sip of water because yeah. all them Heavy. names you just named off. I'm like, shit. Heavy. I'm sweating now. <laughs> like, man, Philadelphia was so good back then. Mo Cheeks, Andrew Tony, Dr. J, Moses Malone, Bobby Jones, they don't get enough credit for what they was doing in the 80s back then. I mean, that team was good. And then they got Barkley, right? It, it just wasn't fair, right? Bird, McHale, Parrish, you know, it, Milwaukee, that Milwaukee team was, was loaded with Marcus Johnson and all them. So we, you know, it was it was hell, you know, up in there. Um but what, what we had and what we were developing was different than all the other teams, right? All those teams you just named. What, what we was developing was identity, culture, belief, systems, you know, understanding, you know, the, 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 those, you know, those things that you carry with you for the rest of your life, right? That's what we was building as a team. And talent-wise, all those people that you just named, we we didn't have that kind of talent. But what we could do is we could out-scheme you and, and we can adhere to a game plan and concentrate and do it for two and a half hours. Most teams, most players, they can't, they can't concentrate for two and a half hours. Right. And so when... When Jordan came in, you know, in in 84, 85, right, you know, he was mega talented. And not only was he mega talented, but we we had never seen an athlete like that. You got to remember, like, in the NBA at that time, you know, Dr. J still was the best athlete. And when Jordan came in younger than Dr. J, I was like, okay, he's the next Dr. J. And, you know, wasn't nobody jumping from the foul line and hanging <laughs> in the air and doing all the stuff around the rim that he was doing. Nobody, you didn't have athletes like that. Um, so he was, a, he was a fascinating watch. So Dumars and I, right? You know, we would, we would be, i never forget, every time Chicago played, you know, Joe and I would be on the phone and and we be talking because we got to we got to play against them, right? And they were playing New Jersey in Chicago, and Joe and I, you know, we we talking and and Jordan came down on the left side, caught on the left wing, went through a couple of dribbles, and then he took off on the left box. And dude floated all the way to the right box. <laughs> <laughs> and then laid it up on the other side. <laughs> and I swear to God, Joe and I were on the phone. And for about five minutes, man, it was just dead silence. silence. <laughs> dead silence. <laughs> the fuck did we just see? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then all of a sudden it was like, Hey man, I see you at practice tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Soon enough. Well, I, this is what mean, we got to deal with. I mean, that dude jumped from the left box and was up in the air and went all the way over to the right box. That's what's special. And shit. laid it up. It was like. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. We had magic on the show um, at the end of December, and your name came up, and. Magic was talking about what you and him went through and how you guys were able to sit down and, and, and patch it up. Which is beautiful, by the way. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was no, beautiful. We were, everyone was big fans of that. Uh, but he also said he would like to see you and Mike patch it up. You called me after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had a conversation on the phone about what was going on. you care to share any of that? Yeah, hey, man, you know, I just, let's, want, let's... I just want some people to be honest. Yeah. Right? I, got, I got no problem sitting down talking with anybody, mm -hmm. right? And as you can see, you know, I, I'm... you open book. I, you know, I, I live with love, peace, truth, you know, honesty, courage. I'm, you know, I stand on my square. I'm upright, you know, I'm, I'm independent. 
And I sit in any chair and I talk to anybody, right? Mm-hmm. But some people don't, they ain't been telling the truth, right? Now, anywhere, anytime, publicly, I don't, don't, don't call me behind the scenes apologizing or asking your friends to apologize, right? You got on national television and you call me an asshole. And then you said you hated me. You said that on national television. Now, if you didn't mean it, get on national television you say that. and apologize for it. Now, if you meant it, let it ride as it is. But so I called you, and that same day, you know who I called? I called Magic Johnson. Magic was on a plane. They was shooting a commercial in Atlanta. Him, Sam Jackson, everybody else. We were standing in the Four Seasons Hotel. We missed each other, right? Because he said he had to go, so he on the plane, right? I call him up. Magic didn't mention Michael Jordan. All right. So I'm still waiting. You know, everybody say this stuff publicly, right? Hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. All right, well, I'm... I'm the type of guy, I sit here, I talk to you, I talk to you. It ain't a person in this United States of America that I'm not willing to sit down and have a conversation with and break bread with. But if you lying and throwing stones from behind the scenes, okay, that's you. But if you honest and you upright on your square, I'm willing to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, so that's all I know. Mm-hmm. Now, where do we go from here? I mean, you told me something interesting. I mean, you have family that had stayed with him at one point. Absolutely. Hey, when, when Jordan first came to Chicago, first of all, we, we were fans of his. And to some extent... Still fans of his. My family, his family, not only did they socialize, hang out, but as I said, you know, I I had a little nephew that lived with him. And and everybody's still cool, right? Ain't no ain't no hate for yeah. Jordan. Mm-hmm. We just want some realness, mm-hmm. right? They're just, you know, like I say, you, you got on national television. And ain't nobody, ain't nobody nowhere has ever got on national television and called me an asshole and then publicly said, you hate me. I ain't heard that from you. I ain't heard that from you. I ain't heard that from no NBA player. And so I'm, and by the way, all them years that, you supposedly hated me. You voted for me to be the president of your union. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you know I, so, I, I seen a lot of pictures of uh, All Star games and y'all laughing and joking. It didn't look like hate. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, like you know, if, if if that, you know, now, now maybe you felt like that privately, and I didn't know. But now that I do know, and by the way, if you didn't mean it that way, then publicly say it. Don't privately say it. You know, Magic, we, we don't need a private conversation. Mm-hmm. This, this man did this on national television, internationally. I have to answer this question, right, in every interview that I sit down and do. Mm-hmm. You asking me this question, mm-hmm. right? So now, now I'm the one who's looking like, oh, why are you talking about Jordan? Why are you saying right, this? Right. When you to put that out there, and now you at home or on your golf course or doing whatever you do, and now I got to answer this BS question. Mm-hmm. So if you man enough, and you and you and you, if you meant it, leave it as it is. Mm. But if you didn't mean it, then come out and clean it up. The same way it came out. Same way it came out, with the same intensity. You gotta respect that though. That's you gotta why I stand. That. I mean, because if the shoe was on the foot, I know I've been disrespected a lot, but if somebody disrespected me on TV during the game, but also at the end of the game, they decided, okay, you know what, I remember I said that. Let me clear this up before we get off air. I got to respect that. I can't hold it. I can't be mad at him no more because he corrected himself. Mm-hmm. Hey, you, you, 
You said Magic and I sat down and and squashed whatever we had. Going. Publicly. Publicly. Magic Johnson apologized. He said, I'm sorry. If I hurt you, when I hurt you, I, I, I didn't mean that. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. I, I got to accept that. And we move on. But if you're going to let this linger out here in this basketball world, and you got everybody else talking, but you ain't saying nothing. Now, if you meant it. Stand on it. Stand on it. But if you didn't mean it, clean it up. Mm -hmm. That's something. You mentioned, uh, you know, obviously it's no secret that you and Magic were the you know, best of friends at one point. Yep. And, and what did it mean to you, to you guys to be able to sit down and, and clear that air for you? It, it meant a lot, not only to me, but it, we didn't know, and I didn't know how much it would mean to all of us, to the world. I, I had no idea, right. you know, because when you when you're going through that, you're just thinking about yourself. Yeah. You're not thinking about really how it's affecting other people. And I just had this same thing happen with Carl Malone and I, right? Um, and by the way, thank you, Kenya. Love you, Saginaw Strong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, but you don't realize what the other person is carrying, right? You you feeling, you know, yourself and your grief and your hurt, right? but the other person who's carrying that guilt, when you have the opportunity and you can relieve them of that, not knowing that that's how much they're carrying, right? That, that, that was a powerful moment, not mm -hmm. only for he and I, but it was a powerful moment for the world, which we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So it's like two moments we've had that we didn't realize what we was really doing that ended up changing a lot of stuff. Like when he and I like first hugged and kissed, yeah. right? Ah, oh, oh, you know what? They, 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 it's like I can't, I can't meet my brother and, and give him a handshake. Whenever I met family, it was always an embrace, right? When we did when we did that in the '80s, two men, right? Black masculinity, you know, and being called into question. You're not supposed to, you know, you're supposed to have this, you know, this toughness mm -hmm. about you and know, all this stuff. Well, when we broke down that barrier, we didn't realize what we had really done. Now, when we saw each other today, first thing we did, we hug each I other. I can wait to hug you when mm -hmm. I see you. Yeah, yeah. And let me, and, and then, mm -hmm. then, then we hug for a minute because I, I, I wanted to feel you, mm -hmm. right? And but back then, that was so controversial, right? Now, us coming together, forgiving, compassion, love. Friendship, right? It's another powerful moment. Not knowing that that's what we were doing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm and I'm glad that he and I got to share that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned, and that, that obviously this is going to come up too. You mentioned you got a chance to sit down with Carl at this last yeah. uh, All Star in Utah. What did you know? How, how did that go? Man, for years, man, I, I I wanted to do something to Carl, man. I, you know, I was well, like, you I, mentioned some people might have, but Kmart told this story about how he was watching that game on TV when he was a youngster and yeah, and, and and got him back for you. Yeah, and I'm and I'm saying thank you. Yeah, you know? that's what I'm saying. So you said thank you, but people might have but, not have caught but, that. Yeah, but yeah. let me, but let me say, let me say why I said thank you, and then let me let me go further with that because for years. That dude put a mark on me, man, and and for years I was like, I'm 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 gonna get my mark back. You know, you put a scar on me, and I'm gonna get my scar back. When I get my scar back, we even. But that, you know, <laughs> not, we, my, not my lick though, mm -hmm. my, my scar. scar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> scar back. A lick on <laughs> here. No, 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 no. Scar for life. <laughs> I need my scar back. <laughs> <laughs> now we, now we even, you know. Straight up. Um, but. And and so fast forward, right? You know, I'm carrying this around for years, for for years. Last dance come out, and and you know every you know the the narrative was you know everybody hated Isaiah, you know nobody wanted him around, nobody wanted him to be a part of it, so forth. So so that was what's being played. So now on the background, I'm getting calls from everybody. I'm getting calls from the shock hit the Chicago Bulls team, teammates, 
people in the Chicago Bulls front office. I'm getting calls from people who was on the dream team saying, hey, man, I, that ain't me. You know how mm. I feel about you. Da, da, da. Mm. Okay, cool. Then I get called from Carl. And I'm like, and he said, hey, man, I, I, and this was years ago. He said, hey, man, I just want to tell you, like, you know, I, I hear all this stuff about the dream team. You know, I Carl talk. I'm a man. I'm a real man. I don't. You know, I ain't hiding behind nothing. You know, I I didn't have nothing to do with that. You not making a team. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm speaking for Stockton and I. We, and he said this on camera. He said, if there was a secret meeting, me and Stockton wasn't a part of no secret meeting trying to keep you off the team. That wasn't us. So now, you know, my next question is, you know, so man, why you hit me like that? <laughs> and this is what I have to respect. And, and, and Kenyon, I, I hope you can respect this too, brother, because, and, and, you know, and all my people in Chicago and in Detroit, everywhere, I hope y'all can respect this about Carl Malone. Because what he said was, hey, look, I, I meant to hit you. That's how we played. You come down the lane, you're going you to get some physicality. So I meant to do it. He said, but I, but I didn't mean to do that. And I apologize because I, I didn't mean to do that. Hey, I have to accept that. You know what I mean? Because that, it, it, now if he would have been like, I'm a tough guy, you know, that's how we play, and yeah, I'm laid you out, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, now, now he gets emotional and he starts crying. And you know, when people start crying, now you crying, it's right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so... You never know what people are dealing with, bro. Yeah, and so I I was only looking at it from my point of view. I never knew the type of guilt that he was walking around carrying. And so by me saying, hey, man, it's okay. I love you, brother. We good. Man, he, he said, you just took the whole mm. weight off my show. Mm, now, mm, I mm. never knew he was walking around with weight. I just thought he was walking around like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a tough dude. Look what I did to you and, and somebody else I'm going to do. But that ain't the way he was thinking. And when he said, yeah, I, I meant to hit you, but I didn't mean to do that. Now, that last part, I got to accept, mm -hmm. right? I and that's, that. you know, that, that was real. So I, I respect that. Mid-80s, mid to late-80s, you start winning, start going on the roll. Mm -hmm. What clicked? We became one. Everybody on the same page. Everybody on the same Homework, page. That one identity, string. That foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I don't care who you sit in this chair. If he's a piston, he going to tell the same story. He going to act the same way. He going to carry himself the same way. We still got a group chat. Mm -hmm. right. uh, John, John said that. Sally. John yeah, Sally yeah. said that. Nah, mm -hmm. nah, nah. This, this, this who we are from day one, right? That's what clicked. It, it wasn't like we became better basketball players. We became like this as opposed to being five individuals, right? Now... A punch is more powerful than a slap. All the time, Bruce Lee. Talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And when you and when you put some when you put some energy in there behind that thing, boom! I'm right? trying to tell you, and that's what we was walking up in there with, right? All, all force, right? Teams had no, they had no shot, right? Because all our togetherness, all force, it was intimidating. Mm -hmm. So when you say what made it come together is those sacrifices, those individual sacrifices that we all was making, that, commu that communication, that crying, that breakdown, those heartaches, you know, all that, 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 that staying together, and then you, you, you become one. And when we became one, we, we, we're probably, we're definitely the most misunderstood team that's ever played in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And we're the most misunderstood team that's ever played in the NBA. And I say team because we were a team. The NBA, you know, wants to promote individuals. Mm -hmm. You know my whole team. Mm -hmm. You know my, 
you know, you know our team to the ninth, tenth man. First and last name. Yes. Our team, right? And that's how we promoted ourselves, right? The NBA wanted to give you the individual. We like, nah, we coming to the captain's meeting. We came to the captain's meeting one time and our whole team came to the That's motherfucking dope. captain's mm-hmm. meeting. <laughs> That's dope. That's making right? a statement. Mm-hmm. And, and so that, that type of togetherness, that type of chemistry now, these are the facts. Our, our first championship in 89, because they didn't understand us, and we got the best record in the league, but we don't have one all-pro on our team. I didn't make first team. I didn't make second team. I didn't make third team. Hatred. Joe didn't make first team, second team, or third team. Hatred. Rodman didn't make first team, second team, or third team. Lambeer didn't make first. Now, we got the best record in the league, and we swept the Lakers, right? And they say the Lakers was hurt, but they don't never say I was hurt when they beat us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. You know, that, but, you know, and, 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 the, and the other point I want to make is the sacrifices in terms of team. Not only did we not have anybody make all pro, but nobody averaged 20 points a game. Hmm. I led with 19. This one had 18. Two had 17. Mm-hmm. This one had 15. Balanced. This one had 13. Balance. Mm-hmm. We were a team. Mm-hmm. Who you going to stop? Mm-hmm. One night I get 35, right? Game five to go to the to the uh, to to beat Boston. The year before, I had thrown the ball away. Come back in '88, we back in game five again. Junior, what you gonna do? I got Magic in my mind. I got James Worthy in my mind because I didn't seen them get up, come back. So that game five, at game five in Boston, I dropped 35, 36. I had like a great game. Come back game six on the closeout game. You know how many points I scored in the closeout game? Nine. Nine. You know who got hot? Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> the microwave. Vinny. Vinny got hot, and it was like, <laughs> all right. Go. Go. Yeah. Now, if we was playing analytic basketball mm-hmm. and playing selfish basketball, mm-hmm. hey, man, I got to get my 20. Yeah. I got to keep my average up, right? right? Right, right. And, and so that balance that you talk about, we can't beat the Lakers and the Celtics individually. But our team, mm-hmm. can we beat Best them? Team. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people say Boston Celtics, the team y'all you played against, was the probably the most fundamentally sound team ever to play in the NBA. Um, you was able to battle with them. How good were they? They were that. They were that. Yeah. Not, not, not only were they that, but they were so smart. Mm-hmm. I mean, Walton, Bird, McHale, Parrish, Ainge, Dennis Johnson. At one point in time, they had Nate Archibald, mm-hmm. Scott Webman. I mean, I mean, they, they were just loaded with talent, but extremely smart. In one year, they went 40 and 1 at home. God damn. Shite. <laughs> how about that? They went 40 and 1 at mm. home. That's how good they were. Mm. Now, <laughs> now, this is how good we were. Okay. Arguably, they say that's one of the best teams to ever play in the NBA, if not the best what team. What season? That was 80, 86, 87, right? And then the Lakers, right? They, you know, one and two, those are the two best teams they say to ever play. Well, that's who we beat. Ran them both down. That's who we beat. Ran them both down. That's yeah. how good we were. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> like, well, you know, like you like like That's you say, just real talk now. Like mm-hmm. you say, y'all y'all the only ones that beat all three of them: MJ, Joy, uh, Magic, and Bird. Name somebody else who beat all three of y'all. All three of them. And let me let me put another add something to it. Yeah, let me add something to it. When we beat them. They were all MVPs of the league. Mm. Magic was MVP of the league. Jordan was MVP of the league. Mm. Bird was MVP of the league when we beat them. Mm-hmm. Hold that. 
<laughs> there it is right there. So yeah. give, me, give me a little bit more about the LB, though. Larry Bird, man. Give me a story, man, about LB, man. So, I, I don't know if people, I don't know how this is going to play with America, right? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but let, me, it let, me, let me just tell you what this dude told me one time, right? Now, all back line at, at one time it was Kelly Trapuca, Bill Lambeer, Kim Benson. Three white dudes. Two of them I ain't ever heard of. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we walk out on the court and, and, and he said, Who guard me? And I said, Well, hey, you know, we both from Indiana, we talking stuff. Me and his mom had a close relationship in, in, in college. His mom would write me like notes, was even writing me notes like when I was in the pros, like, you know, good luck, everything else, right? So Larry used to always call me Cheesy, right? He's like, Cheesy, who guard me? And I was like, you know, I got Kelly, I got Lamb, I got, I got Benson. He's like, you ain't got no brothers? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, like you? He's like you. Disrespecting me. That's what he said. Up. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> he said, hey, man, you can't put no white dude on hey, me. Hey, hey, <laughs> that is straight disrespect, <laughs> right? He said, don't put no oh, white dude shit. on me. So check this out. So the next year we come back, uh -huh. I said, I got somebody for your ass, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, who you got? I said, Rob. <laughs> 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 he said, OK. He, he's a little better. Mm. He say, but don't ever put no white dude on me mm. because that is disrespectful. Mm. I was Larry. like, okay. Now, I don't know how America going to feel about that. They'll but, be all right. But I think he said it in Sports Illustrated, too. Yeah. You can go get the quote. I've, I, well, I've heard I heard other people talk about Larry Bird, and I had conversations with people like John Sally, and he said the same thing. He was black. I, yeah, I was like, man. When, when he I, walked on the court, he was black. Straight, <laughs> hey, man. But that's who he played with. You know, so <laughs> that's I, what I heard. No, he played with the garbage. The, so the garbage truck workers uh, in uh, story is uh, in, in uh, French Lick. You know, he he grew up, you know, him and Quinn Buckner, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so he grew up, you know, even though French Lick, you know, that's that's kind of Larry, you know, he he... He ain't into all that, yeah. right? He like, you know, he did his own thing. But you better put somebody on me that that got I some respect. melanin yeah, yeah, yeah. in their skin. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. If he ain't got no melanin, yeah, I he can't, can't guard me. He can't guard me. That you disrespecting my game. <laughs> and even if he got some melanin, he gonna have a long night. Hey, 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 but long you know night. what though? But you know what though? I know he walked out on the court one time. Somebody said, "Man, who to get this white boy on me? He can't guard me." And Larry served him. All you know the what I'm time. saying? So I'm pretty sure he heard that before Man, too. Man. <laughs> They they used to talk so much trash, man. The, so I remember we we playing them uh, in the elimination game in Joe Louis Arena, uh, and you know, end of the game, they up like eight or nine. They done won the series, and you're gonna try to take that last shot, right? And and Mikael said, "I hope you make this last shot." Because it's your last one of the season. Mm. Why I'm in the air. A <laughs> <laughs> bit air. Bam. Clang. I missed it. Mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. But they used to talk so much trash, man. They, mm. And if you go back and you watch that, the Lakers Celtic um, uh, documentary, you will see how much trash they was talking to. I, I don't know if it was Worthy or Magic was at the foul line. And... And he missed the free throw. And ML Carr walked across the foul line and mm. look, choke the choke sign. Yeah. And then I, man, and and I remember, I don't know if it was 84, 85. So I'm following the series back and forth. The, the Lakers win in Boston. And they just come up in there and they gangsta Boston. Like, you know, because Boston was supposed to be the physical mm -hmm. team. The Lakers was supposed to be showtime and, you know. So Lakers came up in there and just, you know, boom, boom, pound. And, 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 you know, so Larry Bird, the next day, you know, he, he called, he said, my team, you know, he called them sissies and everything else, you know, all in the newspaper, right? 
So now they come back, I think it was game five here. And I mean, it is, I think that's the game that Mikhail Close grabbed line. Rabbins. Close line. Slam threw him out of there, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so now I'm watching all this, right? And I'm sitting baseline, and they enter it in the bird on the, on the right side of the court. Bird on the baseline, and he dribbling down. And Magic come to double team. And I'm like, no, no, no. He ain't getting ready to shoot because now I'm studying. I'm like, you know, now I know when Bird going to do a step back. I'm, I'm like, no. I'm in my mind, I'm like, don't come double, don't come double. And he came in double, and he kicked it out to Dennis Johnson. Mm, and Dennis good. Johnson knocked it down right from the foul line. Boom. Game. And Boston beat L.A. here. But those type of, you know, rivalries going back and forth, I mean, the way they was fighting. And, and I, I felt so sorry and bad for, for Bird because the way Michael Cooper was guarding him, man. Mm. I mean, dude, you, you can see Michael Cooper's fingernails all on Bird's, like, you know, one time he pulled his, his shirt and all you saw was Coop's <laughs> fingernails, like, and but man, they they was going at it, and so now they go back to Boston, and Burr was real clever, so they have an out of bounds play where balls balls here on the right side, and he's coming up to set an up screen. As he come, you know, as, instead of it being a pin down. Yeah, he said no. He comes up to set an up screen. But when he comes to set an up screen now, you taking the ball out. And that's the corner. And as he's setting the up screen, the defender is in front of him. Mm -hmm. And that dude flared to the corner. Just to pick the home. Money ball. And caught it. And when he let it go, I was like, he ain't missing. It was like, ugh. Oh. Hit the back of the rim, but it was it must that ball must have stayed in the air for about five <laughs> seconds. I mean, just spinning perfectly, right? Boom! Hit the back, bounced off, and I was like, "Hey, God was with y'all today, the Lakers," bullets. because mm. I mean, it was so clever of a play that that he was able to up slide ball there, ball came in, and he was able to just touch and rip right in front of the Laker bench. Mm. And if you go back and you look, you'll see Pat Riley like. Hoping it don't go in. Oh, everybody was praying. I mean, every the whole gym, man, when he Held caught the breath. ball. You know how when some people catch the ball, they go, <gasps> Yep. Right? The whole gym. And when he missed, it was like, whew, yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me something quick on Robin. Best athlete I've I've ever seen probably in the NBA. Not the highest jumping. Athlete. But just the best athlete. Like, I, I've never seen anybody who, A, ran that fast. And and then quick jump like that. So my first time playing with him, literally he he gets the rebound, kick it to me on the outlet pass, right? And so when I get on the outlet, now I'm dribbling to the middle of the floor to set the break. As I'm dribbling to the middle of the floor, now this dude just threw it to me. He down there underneath to the back, mm. <laughs> waving for it. Mm. And I'm like, how the hell he get so of course I kick it up. But adjusting to his speed was the first thing I had to do. And then I never saw anybody scientifically break down rebounding the way Dennis Rodman did. So our first, you know, our first couple of games, you know, we'd be in the layup line, and then he'd stop. And he just, you know, stand under the rim. And, you know, it used to be you you lay it up, and then after you do your layups, then you start taking little short pull-up shots, mm -hmm. right? And so whenever we start taking short pull-up shots, he would stop. And so finally, you know, I'm like, what, what you doing, man? Get in line. Like, you know, like, it's how we, he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm counting. <laughs> so Dennis was a little strange anyway. I'm like, I ain't gonna even respond to that. I'm just gonna go <laughs> back to the left. Nigga, what is you counting? <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, I'm counting, right? And 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 so my mind everywhere, right? And 
So finally, you know, now we break up, and he's still standing under the basket, right? And he's just looking at everybody balling. I'm like, what you counting? Like, I didn't, I didn't ask what you counting. I said, what you doing? He said, I'm counting. I'm, I'm counting the spins on the ball. He said, when you shoot, your ball spin like three times. Joe sometimes spin four. This one spent, this dude was counting the rotations on the ball on every player. He knew how long it was going to be in the air, how many times it rotated, where it was going to hit, where it would bounce. I had never seen nobody break mm, down rebounding like crazy. that in my life. That, that was kind of insane. Bro. That was that he was he was a genius, that's man. Dope. Dennis Rodman was a flat out genius mm. when it came to basketball. Mm, mm, mm. I remember when he went to Chicago and they said, "Well, are you gonna have a hard time learning the triangle?" He goes, "It's a triangle." <laughs> right. <laughs> Game five after the after the inbound turnover. Yep. Um, talk about this series and losing it. You say uh, Bird wouldn't be all that if he was black. All that little stuff, you know, that went on. But and after that, y'all went on to win <clears throat> three finals. And I want to talk about that too because two. I mean, excuse me, two. Mm -hmm. Should have been three. Should have been three. Yeah. And talk about that too. That'll be the second question about: Do you believe that the Pistons are a dynasty? Well, we're not a dynasty because technically we didn't win three, right? So is that what? Because there's no written rules. So we had a debate with Freddie Gibbs, who said you guys were a dynasty. We talked about it with Magic too. And yeah, yeah, back yeah. And yeah. Forth. Is yeah. it three that makes you? Is it several runs that makes you? Well, to to me, it's about your your dominance and your banners. Mm -hmm. Right. And even and even though you even though you there's reasons why you didn't get that third banner, right? We would have been the first team in our era to win three. Uh only two teams, if they say the eighties is the greatest basketball era, right? Only two teams went back to back. That was the Pistons and the Lakers. Mm -hmm. As great a team as the Celtics were, they didn't no, go back to back. No. Only two teams went back to back. Mm -hmm. Now, um, our so are we a dynasty? We didn't get the third one. Chicago was the first team to get three mm -hmm. after the set. So Chicago, you can say, okay, what they did those three years and then came back and did, you know, so that's when dynasty stop, dynasty talk starts. Um, Lakers, Celtics, you have to give them dynasty talk because of their historical relevance. Mm -hmm. what, what Magic and Bird walked into, they walked into ready-made dynasties already. They were already dynasties, mm -hmm. right? Celtics were already a dynasty. Yeah. Lakers was already a dynasty. Um, what now, uh, what I would say, who's been the most impactful team on the NBA it's the Detroit Pistons. Mm -hmm. When you look at our style of play, pick and roll basketball, stretch five in Lambeer, small guards, you know, shooting from the perimeter. We didn't have a post-up player. Um, the way we influence the game, look guys like myself, we weren't supposed to win championships. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when I came into the league, all the point guards, Magic Johnson, Reggie Theus, Paul Pressey, you know, everybody was 6'8", 6'9". Mm -hmm. Little dudes won, you know, we weren't supposed to win, right? And as a matter of fact, I'm still the only one that's won this way. Now, Steph, right, has won in Golden State, established a dynasty, but his playing style is different than mine. Totally. I scored and assisted. He scores. So two different ways of impacting but so Golden State, what they did, dynasty. But the most impactful and the most influential team that's played is the Detroit Pistons. Mm. You played D too. I Come still on. hold the record on both ends. And when you look at the playoff record in terms of steals, I think one year I had 66 steals in a playoff run. Damn. 
I'm going to say that again. It's a thief. Yeah, I was. It's a real thief. <laughs> That's a lot of defense 66. right there. But, you know, I, I think we've influenced the game the most from an offensive standpoint and also from a defensive standpoint. And then I would also say from a guard playing standpoint, the way mm -hmm. guards play now, mm -hmm. every team, they don't have a Magic Johnson type guard. They don't have a Michael Jordan type guard. They don't have a Dennis Johnson type guard. Every team right now has an Isaiah Thomas, mm -hmm. Joe Dumars, Vinnie Johnson type mm -hmm. guard. Mm -hmm. You may not like it. You may not want to acknowledge it. <laughs> it is true. But those are the facts. Mm. Right. Mm. Once upon a time, there was a place called the wilderness. We did things out there that we're ashamed of. There's some darkness. Your friendships are a little more complicated than most. Jackets, only on Showtime, streaming with Paramount+.